we may be among the ruins, we must never, for, never forget that all ruins come from a pre-existing civilization. As Fengler and Francis, Francis Parker Yaki teach us, civilizations grow, wilt, and die just like a great tree that provides shade and a high order above millions of, millions of souls. Our next speaker is a writer, historian, protege of Thomas 77, and Virginia, gen Virginia gentleman who seeks to revive the aristocratic spirit and tradition of the West in the winter of Faustian civilization. Please welcome Paul Fahrenheit. Good afternoon, everyone. I don't know whether it is a blessing or a curse to speak immediately after lunch, uh, and I should greatly hope that the cerebrality of this talk will not put you all to sleep, because unfortunately I will use many highly technical terms in the Spanglerian dialect. I will try my absolute best to keep from going off on Morgothian tangents about the brilliance of the pessimist. <laughs> I have an accompanying slideshow to go with my presentation because I believe that when talking about the science of human civilizations, of cultures, of how God manifests his will on earth through us, the visual aids are a fantastic accompaniment. Next slide, please. <laughs> my talk is divided into five parts. You will have the title of the particular part of the talk I will be speaking of, and then there will be visual accompaniments following it. This is the introduction. Next slide, please. <laughs> you're you're going to be hearing that for a while. <laughs> so as I said, um, my name is but in these spheres I go by Paul Fahrenheit. I'd like to preface this talk by expressing my deepest and most heartfelt gratitude towards the organizers of this event, my fellow speakers for giving so many amazing talks. Towards you, the attendees, for making all of this possible in the first place. Truly, thank you for this opportunity. And I hope this thing creates many more opportunities in the future. Finally, I'd like to extend a personal thanks to Thomas 777, who counseled and guided me throughout the formation of this talk and without whom this talk would have never happened. Got love for you, seven words. In this mob, we ride or die. <laughs> so as I've said, my name is Paul Fahrenheit. If the audience will allow the indulgence, I'd like to formally introduce myself, that they may know the man who speaks to them over the next 30 or so minutes. I'm a native of Virginia, specifically the Shenandoah Valley, where my family was among the first to settle. It is true. My family has been on the losing side of every single war, from the Wars of the Roses to the American Civil War. That includes the American Revolution, because they were Tories. <laughs> I, I studied history, political science, law, and metaphysics at Longwood University in Farmville, Virginia. I became a known entity in the sphere via my work for the publication Praxarchy, of which I am one of a number of talented colonists. I was a member of the Virginia National Guard for two years before being removed by the vaccine mandate. Next slide, please. I too would like to introduce the man about whom we will be speaking. He was born in Chicago on September 18, 1917. Francis Parker Yaki lived a life so interesting that I could give a 45-minute talk or longer about his biography alone. He was a concert-level pianist until a car accident in his youth robbed his hand of the ability it used to have. Did nothing to affect his studies or his pen, as they both seemed to greatly benefit from the accident. His IQ was tested at around 170. He attended almost seven universities, finally graduating from Notre Dame Law School cum laude. During the 1930s, he actively supported several far-right political movements, such as the Silver Legion, the Deutsche Amerikanische Bund, Father Charles Colin's periodical Social Justice, in which his first written work appeared, where 
He was also among the best lawyers in greater Chicagoland at the time, never losing a case. With the outbreak of the Second World War, he enlisted in the 43rd Infantry Division for a time before he tricked an army psychiatrist into giving him a medical discharge after a six-month AWOL to Mexico, where he provided information to his many political allies. At the end of the war, he was hired by the Judge Advocate General's Court to write trial records for the second round of the Nuremberg Trials. Here is where Yaki met many of his lifelong associates in the post-war German far right, most notably General Otto Rehmer, who would lead the Socialist Reichspartei, a post-war West German political party with open mid-century sympathies in which Yaki would do extensive work for. They would be the first party banned by the German federal government post-war. In 1948, two years after he was fired from the Nuremberg trials, he would write his magnum opus, Imperium, it was titled, written as a sequel to Oswald Spengler's Decline of the West, post bellum but Yaki emphasizes the theories of other great thinkers in this work, especially Thomas Carlyle, Carl Schmitt, who owned a copy of the German translation of Imperium in his extensive library, and Julius Evelyn. He presented the work to Sir Oswald Mosley when he was in England, and he offered to publish it under Sir Mosley's name. Sir Mosley refused, which caused a general falling out between the two men. From the writing of Imperium until the end of his life, Yaki would perform espionage for any regime he saw as advancing his politics. He created propaganda for Nasser's Egypt, growing to greatly admire the Egyptian ruler. He traveled behind the Iron Curtain and was present at the Slansky trial, which convinced him the Soviet Union was the lesser evil as compared to America. It was likely he was an intelligence asset for either the Czechoslovak government or the DDR. In 1960, after losing his suitcase, Francis Parker Yaki would be arrested in Oakland on falsifying a passport charges. While in San Francisco, he met Willis Cardo, uh, he was jailed, who would become the greatest advocate of his ideas, and he would publish a second edition of Imperium. Yaki committed suicide 11 days after he was arrested, <clears throat> leaving his life a mystery to his contemporaries. Next slide, please. This brings me into the second section of my talk. I title it The High Culture. Even, bef uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Even before the ideas of Yaki are discussed, we must first discuss those of his intellectual predecessor, Oswald Spengler. Many of the audience will be familiar with the broad concepts of Spengler's work. And I apologize if this appears to be a review. Yet I feel I must allow those of the audience who are unfamiliar with Spengler's work to start from a proper place. Oswald Spengler's masterwork, The Decline of the West, later supplemented by his works Man and Technics and The Hour of Decision, is more than its misleading title and out of context quote, which is most famously associated with Spengler, Optimism is Cowardice. The work puts forth a Weltanschauung, which is quite literally epic shattering. It would be an impossible task to cover every idea put forth in the work in the time we have. So I will limit the discussion to three of his main ideas. The high culture in its cycle, prime symbols, and pseudomorphosis. A high culture is a superorganism that appears as a culture, a civilization, or a series of cultures and civilizations to us. It has a natural lifespan of around 1,500 to 2,000 years or about 35 generations from the initial feeling to the final end. Its body, mind, and soul are the particular human stock from a particular geographic area, or at least at first. That is why I included this etching. This is the greatest single representation of what you should be thinking when I say the word high culture. It is a, not a leviathan, but it is a superorganism. Everyone with the Western soul is a part of this superorganism. Think of it as a collective unconscious, but limited to a certain group of people, such as a race, a nationality, or a set of nationalities or races. There have been eight high cultures before, uh, including the Western, but seven before it, as far as we know of. 
There was the Babylonian, the ancient Egyptian, the Indian, the Chinese, the Greco-Roman, the Mesoamerican, the Abrahamic, the, and the Faustian. Each high culture, next slide please. Each high culture undergoes the same cycle, spring, where the initial cultural themes and stories are expressed. Summer, when the cultural themes and stories are refined to their peak. Autumn, where the cultural themes reach their most mature and cultural decadence sets in. Winter, when the culture is largely forgotten in place of science, politics, technology, materialism, and nihilism. The first two, spring and summer, are the culture phase. The second two, autumn and winter, are the civilization phase. Between summer and autumn, a hugely heroic and larger than life figure comes, and his lifetime is the transition between culture and civilization. The final phase of the cycle is the coming of Caesars and uniting the entire high culture into one geopolitical entity, an imperium. Once this has been done, the high culture has two possible deaths, mummification and gotodamaru. Mummification, like a Paleozoic tree in the Arizona desert, is when the high culture is petrified. No new expression comes forth, and the human stock is degraded to the point where all it can do is perpetually relive its own stereotypes. This was the fate of India. This was the fate of China, ancient Egypt, until Mark Anthony, when it well and truly died, and the Abrahamic culture. Gotodamarum, meaning God's damned end, is when the high culture is conquered and erased by a barbarian people, or as Arnold Toynbee calls them, an external <coughs> proletariat. This was the fate of the Babylonians, the Greco-Romans, and the Mesoamericans, who were ended by a thousand men under Cortes and less than two hundred under Pizarro. Next slide, please. These high cultures are differentiated by different prime symbols or internal feelings about the world. These express themselves in every aspect of culture, religion, mathematics, art, literature, architecture, economics, war, music, etc. This is why no high culture can ever truly assimilate another high culture. Just as no one individual can truly assimilate another individual into their own identity. For example, the Faustian man's prime symbol, that is us. Our prime symbol is the will to infinity, as I call it. All barriers must be broken. All things must be known. All space must be taken and held. This is why we are obsessed with technology in ways other high cultures were not. We hate our limitations. We seek to destroy them through metal means. Compare this to the Greco-Roman prime symbol of the human body in the present. Bronze Age Pervert's recent work has done much to elaborate this concept. The Greco-Romans, opposed to us, never looked deeper. Their culture was centered around sophisticated superficiality. The Parthenon can be fully comprehended from one point of view. A Faustian cathedral cannot be. It must be looked at from many directions, both inside and outside. You must get close and look at the carvings of the gargoyles. You must attend the mass to hear the acoustics of the choir in it. The Parthenon, you look at that and you just see the building and you can understand what that building is. I had to pick two pictures of the Notre Dame because I couldn't pick 15. In the center, this is the Hagia Sophia, right? This is a product of the Abrahamic culture soul. The prime symbol of the Abrahamic, or the Magians, as Spengler calls it, the Judeo-Christian Islamic, is the world as a cave. If you look into the dome of the Hagia Sophia, which is right up there, and you walk into it, or you walk into a mosque, and you see the dome at the center of it, the light at the bottom reflects in the top, and lights and shadows are pushed around as people move around. It is a recreation of the Plato's cave metaphor, which is the center of the Judeo-Christian Islamic worldview. Younger high cultures will often adopt the existing forms of older, more established high cultures, as it's the path of least resistance. 
in order to express themselves in the world. Next slide, please. This is called pseudomorphosis. But in old bottles, they pour new wine. Even if the West uses Greek pillars or Magian Christianity, it changes them entirely to fit the Western world picture. As you can see, in a Rembrandt canvas of St. Paul compared to a Byzantine ivory carving of him, or the Roman Pantheon compared to the U.S. Capitol building, different high cultures use different culture forms to fit their own symbols. Next slide, please. This brings me to the third part of my talk, the West. Next slide, please. Many say the West is dead. This is not true, but it appears as such, as we are merely in the crisis stage and we will leave it within the century. Remember the, high, the cycle of high culture, spring, summer, autumn, winter. We are in winter, but only barely. The crisis seems to be the death of the culture to all who live through it. And its horrors are a precursor to what life without a high culture resembles. But we will leave the crisis. The fact that we're in this room shows it is destined. And our epic will begin with the coming of the Western Caesar. Next slide, please. And how do we get here? <laughs> These are the horrors of what a life without a high culture looks like. This is why people think the West is dead. It's not. Next slide, please. How do we get here? Napoleon's life marked the transition from culture to civilization, just as Alexander's marked the same for the Greco-Romans. The Industrial Revolution was the focus of the culture soul, and our will to infinity turned to infinite quantity instead of infinite quality as it was before. The 20th century was the consequence of such and has reaped the sown seeds for the crisis that has been ongoing since 1914. It will end. Our goal, our vision, will only succeed when it is in alignment with the cycle. It will find its expression in the coming of Caesar, as we will articulate what his coming really means. No matter what, the creation of a single Western and European geopolitical entity is what our task is. An imperium from Perth to Prague, created in the image of whomever our Caesar is and the will of God. This will take centuries, we are the origin of the task. Next slide, please. No matter what, all of you must understand that the West will die no matter what. Just like your mother will die, your wife or lover will die, and you will die. This is natural and part of God's order. Next slide, please. Brings me to the fourth part of my talk, the culture bearing stratum. There is in all cultures a spiritual level of the entire population called the culture bearing stratum. To it belong all the creators in the domains of religion, philosophy, science, music, literature, the arts of form, mathematics, politics, technics, and war, as well as the non creators who fully understand and themselves experience the developments in this higher world, the appreciators. That was from a chapter in Yaki's Imperium, my favorite chapter called The Articulation of a Culture. Next slide, please. Yaki's most relevant idea to us is that of the culture-bearing stratum. While the general concept may not be foreign to the audience, I feel it's better to introduce it by means of metaphor than to explain it in the abstract. For this, I will use the Battle of Waterloo, fought on June 18th, 1815, year of our Lord, between the armies of the French Empire and the Seventh Coalition. The armies of France were commanded by the Emperor of France, Napoleon Bonaparte, whose second in command was Marshal Michel Ney. The armies of the Coalition were commanded by Field Marshal Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, and a Prussian contingent, which arrived later, commanded by General Felix Marshal Gerhard Lebrecht von Blücher. Every man I have just named was a part of the culture bearing strap. Next slide, please. Under Napoleon's command was a French army of around 73,000, including regiments of hussars, uhlans, chasseurs, and the famous Old Guard. 
Under Wellington's command was a coalition army of around 120,000, including the British 95th Rifles, the Scots Grey Cavalry, the King's German Legion, Hanoverian Brunswicker and Nassau Infantry, and a corps of Dutchmen under the command of the Prince of Orange. Luger's Prussians included everything from hardened veterans of Jena nearly a decade prior to well-drilled militia known as the Langwehr. Every man I have just named, every one of the nearly 200,000 was a part of the culture-bearing strategy. Next slide, please. Everyone who was plowing fields in the Midlands, counting coins in a London shop, or lazing about in a manner outside Shrewsbury on June the 18th, 1815, was not a part of the culture-bearing stratum. To use Italian elite theory, the culture-bearing stratum is both the elites and the counter-elites within the high culture. The elites are the forces of reaction, the spirit of the previous age. The counter-elites are the forces of innovation, the spirit of the coming age. It has to be said that the globalists have members of the culture-bearing stratum within their ranks. In fact, these are the most important members of their ranks. Whether they are true believers or calculating cynics, realists in other words, they express the ideas of the culture. Next slide, please. The culture-bearing stratum itself is divided into two parts, creators and appreciators. The former expresses the forms of the culture in ways original yet eternal. The latter understands the expressions and transmits them downward as much as it's possible to transmit culture to the masses. To use my Waterloo example, Napoleon, Wellington, Ney, Lucre were all creators. The Grand Armée and the Coalition Army were all appreciators. Given this, one does not need to play a great role in the culture drama to be vital to the culture-bearing strategy. I made this while I was putting together this presentation as I feel it best demonstrates what I'm trying to illustrate with the culture bearing stratum. As you can see at the top, it is divided into two parts. The forces of reaction, and I'm not saying us as reactionaries. Reaction in the sense of holding on to a spirit of an age that is dead, that has passed. Thinkers like Francis Fukuyama, warriors like General Milley, the globalist managers, as compared to us, the counter-elites, the forces of innovation, thinkers like Yaki, warriors like General Patton, everyone in this room is a part of the culture-bearing stratum. Next slide, please. Now remember, this only applies to people within the high culture, as uh, you can have elites in the high culture, uh, but not be of the high culture, as the, uh, the car manufacturer pointed out. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Let me put it plainly. We are the culture bearing stratum because we are the bearers of culture. But culture is often misunderstood. What is culture? A war is as just as much an expression of culture as a poem, a factory as a cathedral, a rifle as a statue. That's another part of uh, the articulation of a culture. Next slide, please. Culture is every aspect of life lived along a higher purpose. Culture is not understood in an intellectual sense, though the intellect itself is not opposed to culture. Culture is felt internally, instinctually. A farm boy south of Bartlesville, Oklahoma, not present at this conference as he's too busy working his fields to know we exist, yet who feels what he is, what he is a part of, and what his mission is, is our equal and peer as a member of the culture-bearing stratum, despite his not knowing the profane words to express that which he feels. A metaphor is helpful in this instance, one which requires those of you in the audience to look past the literal meanings of the words. We fulfill the role that was filled by the French revolutionaries, the Jacobins, the Girondins, the Bonapartists, we represent the coming of the next epic, the shifting of the zeitgeist. The globalists represent the Anshan regime, they are the Metternich, Kaiser Franz Joseph, the Vendees, the Bourbons, reactionaries of an age past. The position they hold now 
will be held by our children when the spirit of the age shifts again. Right now, we are youth, we are innovation, we are the change to the next phase on the wheel. All of you agree that the greatest art is merely the channeling of eternal ideas and concepts through the artist's filter. This is true for all expressions of culture. We are the side of eternal truth. And by being in this room, by engaging with these ideas, you are destined to create culture and to fulfill the cycle that God ordained. Next slide, please. This will be the conclusion of my talk, the last section, Siegfried's Mordenbaum. For those of you familiar with Wagner, you will, you will understand this. Next slide, please. We represent the coming of the next age, which will now and forever be known as the resurgence of authority. That is why we must leverage our greatest and only advantage, the creation of culture in every sense of the word. We, as elites, as members of the culture-bearing stratum, must act in accordance with our nature. Caesar will come, but Caesar was nothing without his legions. Nothing without those senators and officials loyal to him. Next slide, please. And nothing without a culture, however damaged and aged, to place him in the great role he was assigned. Therefore, we must create culture as has been outlined in all of its forms, especially those which belong to the coming age. Next slide, please. In the Volsung Saga and the Nibelungen Lied, later adapted by our peer in the culture-bearing stratum, Richard Wagner, into the four-opera epic cycle Der Ring des Nibelungen, a great hero named Siegfried is hidden from the world. But when he is approached by a wise old man, he learns of his heritage and ancestry and reforges his father's broken sword, Notor. Once he completes the sword, he goes forth and slays the giant-turned-dragon Fafner, thus fulfilling his destiny as a great hero. I believe the call Siegfried heard is the call we hear, that of our fathers, that of our sons, the call to fulfill the destiny we have inherited, that the story of the men of the West may have its destined fulfillment, that it may never be forgotten as long as men draw breath and gaze upon the night sky. <laughs> Thank you. especially from the high culture to the civilizational period. It seemed in a lot of the examples you gave, one of the kind of uh, antecedents to that is a, a period of expansion. Mm -hmm. So uh, Greece conquering the Near East, mm -hmm. um, Rome expanding well, all the Mediterranean. Um, first, is that, is that analysis accurate? Second, uh, is that because uh, uh, too many of the elite are indisposed with just the management of the land, or you know, what is the general uh, uh, reasoning for that? So the life of a high culture is a series of exhausting different ways of expressing its prime symbol. You always start, the high culture always starts with religion and spirituality. It finds a way to express that first. Once it exhausts the potentialities of expressing that, it moves into art and culture. Once it exhausts that, it moves into other things, right? The civilization, the winter period, the last way it expresses itself is through territorial expansion, is through the uh, will to imperium. Rome conquered Greece and Rome conquered the entire Mediterranean world because Rome was the death of Greco-Roman culture. It is when the culture no longer has the death 
no longer has the internal feeling that it must project it outward. And once it is done projecting itself outward, it dies like anything else does. My question is that um, having, having like worked at this company where you have essentially the wealthiest man in the world and these cohorts, they are by and large entirely impossible to track, entirely impossible to, there's no public sphere in which you can confront them, right? The elites of Rome, the elites of Greece, right? They would see their leaders walking among them as people. And so I guess my question is, how can there, and this kind of boils down to managerialism or Bernheim or Fengler or whatever, how can a counter elite possibly physically displace people who can't be tracked, who have seemingly endless amounts of wealth, and who can deperson people, individuals, and entities at the snap of their fingers? I have a two-part answer for you. Number one, I want to illustrate the differences between the Greco-Romans and the Faustians. The Greco-Romans culture was one and all exoteric. Socrates did his philosophizing in the Agora. To think of Descartes or Leibniz doing the same thing is ludicrous, right? Mm -hmm. The West's culture is one and all esoteric. It is limited to the few. The same thing goes with our elites. Our elites are esoteric. Our elites are limited to the few. They get di displaced by another esoteric group of elites. I think esoteric is one of the adjectives that could describe this group. <laughs> <laughs> but to answer your question practically, they have all the money in the world, they are impossible to track, but unfortunately for them, the politics of blood triumphs over the politics of money. And blood is coming, that's for sure. Whether it's ours or others, it remains to be seen, but blood is coming. You can't buy the man holding a shotgun to your face. I, I, I know that's very general, but that is, that's Spengler's contention. The elites are foxes, right? But there are lions coming. Lions who know how to use their own systems against them. Lions who know how to utilize technology to be lions. That's right? Lions. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yeah, so for um, part of the age. Uh, so <laughs> my, my question is, I'm not, I'm not entirely familiar with uh, this type of work. Um, I'm, I was listening to the audio book, funnily enough, uh, on the way here. Um, but are, are, are there really any exceptions to, to, the, to the laid out rules? Or like, I know there's fluctuations between like the age of a tree or the age of a person, like, and he compares it to a plant, yes. But like, are there any like explicit exceptions where it's just like, yeah, we can't actually square this in this view? None that I've found. Um, Spengler's worldview is, the reason I, I almost preach it so much is because it is quite literally comprehensive of everything. Um, <laughs> We might archaeologically come across like Atlantis or Hyperborea, and that might be an exception, but you know, until such point, our, um, uh, all of our human civilizations that we know of, going all the way back to the earliest one, which is the Babylonians, went through the same cycle. Okay. So went through the same, and you can find charts. If you, get, if you find the original version of Decline of the West, um, where you can find the charts online, Spengler outlines the different stages of the cycle um, with different high cultures both in art, in architecture, in politics, in other such things. Okay, so follow-up question then. Um, so we're, we're seeing a very like a, a generalized rule set that, that actually like has predictive power. So you're mm -hmm. saying that this is, we, we basically essentially get a peek at the script of what's going on. And this has happened in the past, even we know that this script, this script ultimately manifests itself in culture. And we're just, I don't know, privileged to get a peek at it. We have, what is, Something that I'm, uh, I know Anglo Ortho is probably getting sick of people referencing his talk, but something that Anglo Ortho said that completely sticks with this is we have a role to play. We are in this room, we hold the principles we hold because we have been tasked with a mission. You don't just hold these principles to hold these principles. Yes, you do because they're true, but they're useless if you don't fulfill the mission with them. That's what I have for it. Thank you. You don't. Uh, I just wanted to ask on how that question was, what about the Chinese high culture? What's their place in all this? So they were long dead um, at about the birth of Christ. Um, the, their high cultural cycle occurred thousands of years before Christ. As a matter of fact, their winter, the coming of the Caesars, was actually the first emperor most people can name, Chen Shi Huang. Um, he was the death of Chinese culture, just as Socrates, Plato, and the like were the death of Greco-Roman culture. 
um, in the philosoph philosophical sphere. Yes, sir. So this is expansion through Imperium is this last gasp. Um, does it carry the same motivations through different uh, cultural cycles, or is it kind of different forms of either kind of self-inflicted suicide or amnesia or you know blindness to whatever degree, and then falling onto that? What's the diagnosis for what we're currently going through? Yes to everything you. Yes to every adjective you just outlined. A high culture in the states that we're at is an old man. Is a man. He's not on life support yet, but. He's senile, he, doesn't, he remembers bits of his life in flashes, but he doesn't fully comprehend the memories he has. I think you, you would all agree that that's a good description of what our cultural inheritance is. Yeah. We are senile old men remembering a beautiful life that was once ours, but is only ours now in flashes. Sounds like Biden. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the motivations throughout the high culture, throughout the different cycles through the past, um, have been unique to those cultures. For us, it's our will to infinity. We gotta make the God Emperor of mankind sometime, you know? <laughs> We've gotta remake the Holy Roman Empire. That's my dream, we make, remake the Holy Roman Empire. But, if that answers your question. Right on. Well, first of all, very, very good job, Paul. You had a great command presence of the room to keep everyone awake after that uh, lunch. So, good I just yell a lot. Like, fourth and Lincoln at the end, and we're all going to have sharks. Uh, you know, it's not going to say everything. But, uh, my question is uh, you mentioned uh, Caesarian like, figures, mm -hmm. such as Napoleon, Caesar, Alexander the Great. Um, what do you think would be like, the commonalities between these uh, figures that we look for? So Napoleon and Alexander the Great weren't Caesarian figures. They were they were transit they were their life in every high culture there is an individual who is quite literally the fulfillment of the idea of the heroic in their culture. Napoleon is the pure Faustian man. He was some freaking nobody from Corsica who took the world because he wanted to. That's a very Faustian thing, right? Some nobody comes along and becomes everything. For Alexander, for example, he was the embodiment of Achilles. He was living Achilles, the, um, the Greek agonic ideal made flesh. Um, the Caesars are different. Um, Caesar was a, a polit politician. He was a uh, speaker who had good command of the material aspects of warfare. Um, Western Caesars think Cecil Rhodes, think um, uh, Andrew Carnegie, think uh, John Rockefeller, those type of gentlemen ruthless individuals who are quite literally their command is gathering up the mass man, the mass material, and essentially using him as a big building block or a big sledgehammer to achieve his will. Alexander and Napoleon had art and grace to what they did. Brutal as it was, they had art and grace. The Caesars will not. Die Merchant. Well, the optimistic guess is us. Like, yeah. not, I don't think anyone in this room will be Caesar, um, but I think we will be his legions. I think we will be the senators who support him, the, the local stock and our children that he will draw upon. But um, uh, my guess is that Caesar will be a wigger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So under this paradigm, we're in the winter of our civilization. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that we should be trying to accomplish during the winter? Bring about Caesar. Okay. Bring so about, try to... And does Caesar represent spring? He represents the end of it. It's like, in order to live a fulfilling life, you need to have an old age as much as you had a youth. Okay. Right? In order to fulfill the West as a living thing, it needs to have an old age as well as it has a youth. So, I wish I could come up and say to you all that the West is going to last forever and that it's never going to die. I can't do that. All of these other high cultures have lived and died. Right? There will be another high culture that comes after us. Because this is how I see God manifesting his will in the world through the creation of culture, through worshiping him. 
not just in faith, but in, um, uh, in other acts. I see all culture as a basically a prayer. You sit there and write a story, that's a prayer. You, you know, even, even in trade work, you build a wall, that's a prayer. Any sort of creating order is a prayer, is an exaltation of God. I don't know if that answers your question, but, um, uh, Charlie. Um, so you mentioned uh, the idea of death versus petrification mm -hmm. as the end state of culture, and I suppose the Chinese are currently petrified. Yeah. Um, do you, or the Spangler, or, or Yaki, or any of the thinkers uh, you referenced, have an opinion on whether death is preferable to <coughs> petrification? Are we seeking death as opposed to... So I will, I will cite the last page of Man and Technics. Um, I wish I had the quote in front of me because it's fantastic. I'm sure all of you have heard some version of it, right? But ours is the destiny to fight in the lost position. Like the Roman soldier whose bones were found at Pompeii, who died because no one relieved him of his post. That is greatness. That is being a thoroughbred. We need to play our role. That's why we're here. You sir, I know you had your hand up for a while. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I was just going to ask, um, you know, is the death doom? Does this, um, the death of the high culture, is it doom forever? In, in a way, like anti black pill, like, um, you know, the death of the Chinese culture, well, it's more of a petrification, yeah. but will their high culture ever return? Like, is there any estimation that's like when the West or the new high culture of, you know, us comes back, in, in, is what I'm trying to get at. Maybe when we when the Kali Yuga ends and then we go through all the other ages and get back into the next Kali Yuga, maybe it will. Um, but I don't see the West as any better than the than the ancient Egyptians and the Greco-Romans and the Babylonians. We're not inherently different from them, other than how we internally are composed. I especially is it guaranteed that a Caesar would actually come from people like us, or could it come from something like the? Uh, Crowley's Age of Horus or uh, Age of Aquarius. So, I don't put a lot of stock in that New Age type astrology BS, um, but I am, <laughs> I am familiar with it. Um, I think Caesar will come not from us because Caesar is inherently a man of action. Um, I'm not saying y'all aren't men of action, but you sat here for three days, listen to blowhards like me to talk about fucking high and stuff like that. <laughs> so, no, I kind of, I was half joking when I said Caesar would be a wigger, but I kind of believe that because if you look at modernity, what are the places that produces the hardest men? What are the places that produce the men who are ready to fight? Ghettos? Yeah. Look at Thomas. You know, Thomas grew, like, you know, Thomas is an older kind of guy, but he's like unique. Uh, so maybe I could be wrong and Caesar will be some classically educated Harvard guy who comes along and speaks 15 languages. But I would still be the first one to sign up for his legions, whether he was a Whig or whether he was a Harvard guy. I've been mean to this side of the room. I haven't picked anyone on this side yet. Any questions over here? Yes, sir. Um, so I guess my question is, um, so we're in the winter and yeah. the Caesar, uh, I don't know if inevitable is the right word. I don't, I'm not super familiar with Spangler. But that's the, 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 the function of that would be to galvanize the, the death of the high culture and lead it into its final stages. But is there also a sort of a sense in which that death will, and the, the content of the Caesar, uh, the political content would sort of s almost set, set a spiritual tone for a new high culture or a new phase? So I'm going to answer that, once again, two parts. Um, number one, Spengler predicted that the next high culture after us would be the Russians, because um, they have not had a high cultural period yet. They've been living under the Western pseudomorphosis, having Western forms forced upon them, starting with Peter the Great. The Russians aren't inherently different people from everyone. That's why um, uh, you know, Spengler even picked out a prime symbol for them. Um, but number two, I guess you can say that um, uh, some of the aesthetics of Caesar, of whatever Caesar comes, will be adopted by the next high culture. Like, I mean, shit, we still talk about Caesar all the time, right? 2,000 years later, um, to the point where a lot of us didn't even recognize his cultural role. <clears throat> so, 
It's what I said at the, at the last part of our speech. Our story will be remembered and it will be retold. It's just the people who are retelling it won't understand how we internally conceived it. Just like how we don't conceive how the Romans perceive themselves, how the Egyptians perceive themselves and all that. If that answers your question. Yes, sir. So, I, I haven't read Spen yet, but uh, he seems to be a smart dude. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked back through history and noticed a pattern. Did these other cultures have that knowledge as well? Yes, actually. So, um, uh, in the Meiji, every culture has a Spengler, by the way, right? Spengler is just the Faustian Spengler. For the Magians, uh, Ibn Khaldun did a very similar thing. Um, when he looked back on civilizational cycles um, near the collapse of the, of the uh, Abbasid Caliphate, I think. And um, uh, this was actually a time in history, people, a lot of people don't understand this, but um, uh, towards the end of the Abbasid Caliphate, feminism was a real thing. People, there were women professors of Islamic law. This was in fucking like 14th, 15th century uh, Baghdad, right? Women were teaching law. And they were even pushing for women to be judges, right? So, you know, feminism is a cancer, sure. But it's not unique to us. It comes around in its different forms with all these high cultures. Gentlemen in the back. Um, so in the second part of your talk, you talked about how the Faustian culture is obsessed with technology and that we're better at technology. Yep. I, I would say the more useful framing is that we are better at technology for the purposes of what we do. Technology is just a manifestation of the will of the spirit. So other cultures might see us as a little bit more uh, technologically depraved because our culture doesn't satisfy their needs, whereas our technology satisfies the, uh, the needs of the Faustian spirit. Well, so it's not I wouldn't necessarily say that, it's that we are more technologically advanced, but we're more technologically advanced for our specific goals. So I don't know if I use the word better, but I agree with the sentiment that you're putting forward. Um, in many ways, yes, uh, other high cultures were more advanced than us, uh, especially in metaphysics. The Romans had a much better grasp on metaphysics than we do, right? Um, the Egyptians were extremely um, technologically advanced. The Chinese understood history in ways we can never understand history, right? Even though we are one of the more historical uh, cultural souls that have existed. But you are correct, um, and I'm going to make a point that Spengler makes in the Hour of Decision is that I'm not. Uh, the reason that the barbarians, which I used to apply to everyone who is outside of the Western culture, so um, Africans, mestizos, and the like, they don't have the internal spiritual need for technology the way we do, right? The central motif of the Faustian man has been Deus ex machina, God from the machines. The left, as we have described it as the deniers of reality, because that is what they are. The left is the worst aspects of the Faustian man. The left seeks to bring about a crude caricature of not only reality, but of God. They seek to recreate God and then recreate themselves as God in their own image. And they'll fail, because you can't. But that's what makes them such an existential threat and such a civilization-dissolving force. It's because they think that they're above they're, they are the worst aspects of the Faustian man. Yes? Sort of going along with what he said, um, first of all, um, I'd like to thank you for the moving speech. Appreciate it. I moved like 100 minutes on the track. Sorry. <clears throat> I need a minute. <laughs> it's in the in the purple and then the jump uh, on the Is Spengler necessary to understand the author? It's kind of like can they be read separately? Is what I'm saying. So that's kind of like asking: Is Guinan necessary to read Ebola? Um, yeah, but uh, if you the reason I push Imperium as a book so much, right? is because you could come into Imperium with absolutely no knowledge of anything on the dissident right, and not only will you be exposed to Spengler's theory, you'll be exposed to Carlyle's theories, to Evola's theories, to Schmidt's theories, right? Imperium is just a catch-all book for all of this stuff. So, if you want to understand Yaki's ideas on the surface level, you could just read them straight up. You could just read Imperium. I'd actually, 
recommend if you don't have a lot of time reading Perium over Decline of the West, because Decline of the West is about this thick, both of its <laughs> volumes. I haven't even sat down and read through the whole thing from start to finish. There are very few people who have, except for maybe Morgoth, but he's insane. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I'd recommend to you. Um, that's why I push Yaka so much. Gentleman in front of him. Um, so this is a slight bit of trying to get clarification mm -hmm. or making sure I understood you. So in the latter half of your speech, um, you kind of seem to imply that we should embrace the winner. Not necessarily like the scum of it, but that we are in the winter and we should kind of embrace what it is instead of being in the spring or pretending we're in the autumn or anything like that. Yes, and I will tell you why. Um, Mozart's, Rembrandt's, um, give me a great literary figure in literary. Shakespeare's, oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Come in the spring and the summer. That is when the culture writes itself and paints itself and composes itself into existence. We're never going to get any one of that quality ever again, just by virtue of how the culture works. That doesn't mean those people are going away. That doesn't mean that, um, I mean, if the leftists get their way, they might go away. But, um, um, but that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, Wagner's operas will disappear. That doesn't mean that Moby Dick will be taken off all of the shelves. We, we still have the forms of Western culture available to us. They're not gone. The fact that we're all in this room, the fact that I've had, I have not had a single bad conversation from the start of this event to the end of it. We are all scions of the Western culture. We are all containers of it, right? The last bastion of it, sure. But shoot, I'd rather be in the last bastion than die out in the plains with the freaking last man who sits there consuming Marvel movies and thinking he's a culture man for it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my composure. I'm, uh, forgive me. It's no, just, you're fine. Seeing a, a tall man like yourself from Virginia uh, speaking of <laughs> <the> things I'm <laughs> <laughs> with the advancements of technology, with rich elites already putting people in space, do you think that it would be our mummification if one day, maybe in just a couple of generations, we would make colony ships full of Westmen to take our civilization to the stars? Would that be perhaps we make our Faustian bargain? Or would that be us breaking the cycle and actually fulfilling our destiny to be eternal and great like our dream? Well, we already made the bargain back when we were first originated. Like, that's been done. Our soul is gone. We can only hope to atone for it. Um, and yes, I would agree with you. I think that the mummification of the West, of the Faustian culture, you know, if it's even scientifically possible to colonize planets, because I've, I've heard tons of arguments that it's not even possible to do that. But if that is feasible, um, yes, I do think that we would not have any sort of Martian Shakespeare's, or we wouldn't have any, any sort of, um, uh, you know, Martian Rembrandt's or anything like that. You know, unless that human stock managed to, unless a new high culture is born on a planet other than Earth, unless God decides, oh, you know, they're on Mars now, I should probably give them a new thing to do about. But, <laughs> you know, but, That's why I asked, because to me that seemed like not our salvation, but our mummification. It is. It very much is. Um, you know, India and China are the, the two, I don't want to say living examples, but the two examples of it. You know, Indians and Chinese haven't had any great writers that were as good as, um, uh, I don't even know the man who wrote the Bhagavad Gita or the Mahabharata, but those are both amazing, outstanding creations of literature. Uh, the Tao Te Ching, the, um, uh, the Art of War, they haven't had anyone that, that cultural shattering, that epic shattering for thousands of years. You know, and that's just because they're a mummified culture, and all they can write about is the things that they already created. Very so if we can examine the botanical metaphor, the Chinese tree civilization died 2,000 years ago, and since then that soil has lain fallow. The Indian civilization died, and Indian soil has lain fallow. The Roman civilization died, the soil did not lie fallow, it almost immediately prospered as a new seed and formed the civilization that we are the inheritors of. Mm -hmm. So when our winter comes, do you have any reason to expect we will lie fallow, or do you think there will be a third birth, and what's different? Why would that happen? 
My theory is, at least with Europe, I can't speak to America, but at least with Europe, um, I agree with Spengler that the Russians are the next high culture. Um, and as you say, that fallow soil, because of geographic proximity, I think will be taken by them, like the, um, uh, like the Roman Empire in the Mediterranean was taken by the Teutons uh, in about 400 AD. So that's my, that's my answer to that. But that's just my prediction. You know, I'm in the business of augury and prophecy, but I'm not always right. <laughs> Thank you. Gentlemen right there. So given the, um, the position Russia occupied yep. historically you know, in this civilizational cycle, uh, just being like a vessel taking in you know, some aspects of Western culture, if you're right and you know, uh, Russia basically is the next generation in Europe, do you think that the United States then would become the Russia of that culture and just like take <laughs> elements of it? Because of its proximity, you know, the cultural influences. I can't, I don't think I can properly answer your question because Europe is easy to predict because of geographic proximity, but there's two big oceans between Russia and the United States. So who knows, maybe the mestizos will sort themselves out and there'll be a rebirth of the Mesoamerican high culture. There'll be something like that the new high culture in the Americas, but I just don't know. Sure. Right. Um, it's been a while since I've read either Spangler or Yaki in entirety. Uh, could you remind me, how do these cultures form to begin with? So these cultures form, um, for lack of a better word, the high culture is basically born into the world, right? Uh, a certain series of events. Um, a certain human stock of people in a particular area are imbued with a sort of energy, are imbued with a unique new expression of culture. Right? The West was born in the ashes of Charlemagne's empire. Right? Charlemagne represented something new. Right? Um, the Greco-Romans were born um, were born with the death of the Mycenaeans and in the Trojan War during the Bronze Age collapse. Right? Um, I can't tell you how the Indians were born because they didn't write anything down, which makes them very infuriating to study. Um, I can't tell you how the Egyptians were formed because they write literally, wrote literally everything down, uh, which makes them infuriating to study. Um, but they always form with, in similar circumstances when they arise, when there's almost a sort of eternal return back to this, you know, I don't want to use the word Bronze Age, but that's the best way to describe it, this sort of heroic pure, almost Conan-type age. Um, that's where high cultures arise from. Would it be fair to say that we get to give the things about the West that we love to our descendants, but, but that it does not continue to be great? So, they won't be able, maybe not our children, but our grandchildren probably, and our great-grandchildren, won't have the internal soul, at least according to Spengler, won't have the conception that we do of the West. They'll, they'll have it because they'll, they'll live it. They'll live it because humans live, and they live based off of norms and all that, but they won't know it. They won't understand it as a unique thing like we do. I'm just curious, do you think it's possible to pull an adventure by innovation? I would think the hot book in the it's just so I had that theory once, all right? I had the theory that, the, that um, uh, FDR was actually the Caesar and that the gay is the adherent, all right? Because it does represent the worst tendencies of Faustian man. Um, but if I believe that, I have no reason to be here. Uh, and I have no reason to give this talk. So no, because Caesar hasn't come yet. Um, <laughs> Unless, uh, when he does come and the political system founded in his image or basically glorified despotism with some like bells and whistles thrown on it, um, that's when I think petrification will start. Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much for letting me talk.